Buenos días a todos y bienvenidos a este webinar de la red CEALC. Este webinar será en español e inglés, pero contaremos con interpretación simultánea en ambos idiomas. Para acceder a la interpretación, solo tienen que seleccionar el icono del mundo que se encuentra en la esquina inferior derecha de su pantalla. Hagan clic sobre este icono para seleccionar el idioma de su preferencia. Además, podrán utilizar el botón de Q y A o preguntas y respuestas ubicado en la esquina inferior izquierda de su pantalla. Muchas gracias por su participación y bienvenidos. Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to this webinar by the Red Cell Network. This webinar will be conducted in Spanish and English. However, we will provide simultaneous interpretation in both languages. To hear the interpretation, you need to click on the globe icon on the lower right corner of your screen. When you click on this icon, you will be able to select the language of your preference. You will also be able to utilize the Q&A or questions and answers bottom that is on the lower left corner of your screen. Thank you very much for your participation and welcome. Ahora, le paso la palabra a David Rosas, especialista principal de la División de Mercados Laborales del BID, para comenzar este evento. Gracias y bienvenidos. Y buenos días, muchas gracias. Eh, y bienvenidos a todos a nuestro primer eh, webinario de la serie de webinars que, que organiza la red SEAL y que va a organizar la red SEAL en este año 2023. Este, como saben, estos, estos webinars que organizamos desde la red son espacios de intercambio de conocimiento entre los servicios públicos de empleo de la región como los servicios públicos de empleo fuera de la región, ¿no? Este, en este part webinar particular, lo que estamos buscando es presentarles, por un lado, un marco conceptual sobre el poder y la importancia que tienen las alianzas dentro de los servicios públicos de empleo para ampliar y, y fortalecer el alcance y así cumplir mejor, ser más eficientes, más efectivos en los servicios que ofrecen. Segundo, compartir experiencias de éxito de servicios públicos de empleo de Europa que lo vienen haciendo muy bien, como son el caso de Croacia y Francia. Y tercero, presentar el, un plan, el, les vamos a presentar también para terminar el plan de actividades que hemos preparado desde la red para este año, para apoyarlos a ustedes, nuestros miembros, a que sigan mejorando, fortaleciéndose eh, 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 este año. ¿no? Eh, para, para terminar, quisiera agradecerle a nuestro panel de lujo que, que tenemos hoy para el webinar, eh, empezando por... Imon Davern, que es experto en servicios públicos de empleo, a Claire Arenales, que es la jefa de equipo de movilidad internacional del Servicio Público de Empleo de Francia, llamado Pol Emploi, a Cristina Masalín, que es la asesora principal del Servicio Público de Empleo de Croacia, y finalmente a nuestro coordinador de la red, André Franco, que les va a hacer esta presentación de las actividades que tenemos previstas para este año. ¿no? Así que sin más, eh, quisiera darle el paso a Sofía, que va a ser la moderadora del evento y desearles a todos que de verdad esperamos eh, que puedan aprovechar de este webinar y, y que puedan aprovechar de los webinars siguientes que vamos a hacer durante el año. Sin más, gracias y vamos Sofía, te lo paso. Muchas gracias David, buenos días a todos y todas, gracias por conectarse a este el primer webinar de la Red CEALC del 2023. El día de hoy, como dice David, vamos a estar hablando de un tema que es de suma importancia para los servicios públicos de empleo de la región. Tenemos a tres invitados de lujo y ahora voy a cambiar a inglés para presentar a nuestro primer panelista. Mr. Imon Davern has over 40 years of experience in the employment and welfare sector. He previously worked for the UK Department, Department for Work and Pensions from 1982. He was employed on a number of operational delivery strategy and policy roles, including managing the project for the first integration of employment and social support service in the UK, representing the public employment service on a number of delivery partnerships, and leading the PES international team from 2008 to 2014. He then spent three years working for the European Union, focusing on employment service improvement and reform, and development guidelines adopted by the European Union Employment Committee for integrating services to the support labor market integration of long-term unemployed people. He now works as a freelance expert, particularly focused on service modernization 
and increasing labor market access for disadvantaged groups. He has participated in many seminars and published studies on partnership development. As you can see, Iman is really a, a deluxe uh, guest for this panel. So Iman, uh, be very welcome to this webinar and thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sophia. And first of all, good morning, everybody. It's a real great pleasure to be able to participate in this discussion and many thanks indeed for the invitation. If we could have the uh, next slide up, please, yes. Sophia. Thank you very One much. One second and we will be on the air. Perfect. So we can move to slide number two. Thank you. Thank you very much. So partnership working, first of all, has a great many different definitions. Um, I think for me, the most helpful one is the final definition on the slide, which describes partnership working as the joint development of products and services through sharing risks, costs and resources. Because essentially partnership working is about organisations, including the Public Employment Service, having a shared commitment to the same goals and objectives with some pooling of resources. And of course, resources don't only mean direct financial transfers, they often mean sharing of premises, sharing of staff time and other sorts of collaborations. If we can have the next slide, please. Thank you, Sophia. So the way partnership operates is influenced by many, many factors especially the institutional setting of a public employment services. And public employment services are more and more frequently delivering services as part of a wider group of organizations. They're no longer monopoly providers of services, which they were perhaps in most cases 20 or 30 years ago. And indeed, I think there's a growing consensus that partnership working is absolutely key to successful delivery as we move into an area of great change and to support uh, citizens to navigate the modern labour market. Next slide, please, Sophia. Thank you. The history of public employment services goes back now well over a century, as I'm sure colleagues will be aware. But I think an ongoing theme of development has been that the policy frame provided by the International Labour Organization has evolved dramatically since 1919 when well, I think the second ever ILO convention recognized the role of public employment services. At that time, they tended to be the sole providers of employment services in countries. But over the last century, there's been a sequence of conventions which have helped to provide a context for increasing partnership between employment services and other organizations. And I particularly draw your intentions to uh, Convention 181 of 1997, which for the first time formally recognized the important role that private employment agencies play in delivering services and provided a context for their increasing cooperation with the public sector to integrate unemployed people. If we can move on to the next slide, please, Sophia. Thank you. So I think the point is that in all of your daily work, you'll be well aware that public employment services or particularly their clients necessarily are often engaged with many, many organizations. So to ensure somebody's social and economic integration, they may well need to resolve barriers which affect many areas of their lives. And so there is a clear logic for public employment services offering an overall support package to ensure the integration of unemployed people will be liaising with some or perhaps sometimes all of these different organizations. So many organizations can support the individual. So of course, it's entirely logical that the organizations are working together and not operating in silos. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Thank you. So why are partnerships necessary? I think primarily they're necessary to ensure the better coordination of social and economic policy delivery. They help us improve our ability to deal with labour market disruption and shocks. And I think the experience of employment services globally in dealing with the COVID pandemic was a clear example of how vital partnership working was to ensure that we could deal with the significant labour market disruption that was unfortunately visited upon us by the um, pandemic. It's very, very hard to integrate an individual citizen with a range of complex problems if the different agencies supporting that citizen don't 
cooperate. So there needs to be a kind of transversal approach to make sure that operational delivery to an individual is coordinated and there are not duplications and gaps in the support packages provided. And of course, more and more support from an individual from a variety of organizations can be the responsibility of many different agencies. So it's crucial that those agencies work together. Next slide, please. Thank you. An interesting question is why partnership working has increased so dramatically in the last 20 or 30 years. I think it's for a number of reasons, particularly at the moment, the incredible growth of digital services and information technology simply means that in all spheres of life and all areas of public policy delivery, it's clearly much easier than it ever was before for organizations to exchange data, for individual citizens to access services digitally. And of course, in that regard, it's then much more easy for organizations to have a far more real time and regular uh, contact using digital means. The public have much higher expectations of public employment services than was the case uh, again several decades ago. And an expectation of a citizen is that they are able to engage with the government and public services digitally, and they expect to be able to seamlessly engage with government support and not need to have to have a cumbersome and rather disjointed journey to pass their details to government to receive their support packages. And with changes in the labour market, massive changes in occupational design um, and, the, and the increasing skills gaps actually, as there is a shortage of many of the skills needed for people to engage in the modern digital economy, there is a need for a much more personalized support approach to meeting individual needs. And personalized packages, as I mentioned previously, require support from a range of different actors and those actors need to work in concert with each other. So there is a clear need driven by changes in the labor market and changes in and developments in technology for public employment services to work in partnership with other actors. Next slide, please. Of course, partnerships can offer many, many benefits to citizens, staff delivering services, and of course, employers who are hoping to receive a good supply of suitably skilled workers to apply for their vacancies. Partnership working can massively increase the capacity of government and other agencies to deliver support to the individuals. Where organizations are able to operate seamlessly and regularly exchange information with each other, it's much more uh, easy to deliver a flexible service to an individual. The ability to share data using digital support means, means that the overall store of knowledge available to all actors delivering support for citizens is greatly expanded. The fact that services can be much better coordinated means that we can bridge gaps and avoid duplication, where previously there were often situations where agencies operating in parallel silos were delivering services that duplicated uh, each other, which was obviously wasteful. So there is the ability through partnership working to improve coordination and make a much more effective use of funding. And crucially for the growing relationships between public and private service providers, and also to improve our service offering to employers, there is much more ability to share vacancies between organizations and share registration details, which can be a win-win for both the public sector and the private sector. If we can move on to the next slide, please, Sophia. Thank you. So partnerships can also offer uh, increasing benefits in terms of improved results. Partnership working also means that perhaps the customer can have more choice. A feature of employment service delivery in many countries is now that rather than a citizen only being able to seek support from one particular agency, they are able sometimes to have more choice in deciding which support organization may be the one best suited for meeting their needs. Some countries are now operating employment services as part of what we call a wider ecosystem, where a range of partners are potentially delivering services. And there is some evidence that competition between service providers can provide a focus on driving up standards and improving service delivery. Partnership working can also identify where gaps are in the overall service provision in a particular country. And so 
One virtue of partnerships can be to ensure that there is increased service coverage and previously left behind individuals and groups can now access services, which may not have been the case hitherto. And clearly improve partnership working and particularly the involvement of employers organizations and employers on service delivery partnerships means that employers can have more influence on the way public employment services are being designed and delivered. This can increase the profile of employment services with employers themselves. And for public employment services, it can be a very effective device for growing business. And effective partnership working, including employers, can particularly mean that the market share of labor market vacancies available to public employment services can increase by virtue of effective partnership working. Next slide, please, Sophia. Thank you. So public employment services operate in many, many different partnerships, but their role in partnerships can vary greatly from country to country or indeed case to case. Sometimes public employment services are the lead organization. They initiate the partnership, they chair the partnership, and they're very much driving it with support from partner organizations. On other occasions, public employment services may be joining a partnership initiated by other organizations as a contributing partner. So dependent on the um, nature of the issue, which organization had the lead in first perhaps having responsibility for dealing with a uh, recognized challenge, then the public employment services may be the lead. Alternatively, they may be contributing and supporting a partnership. It's important to note that the genesis of partnerships can sometimes be from the centre of government. It could be that a new top level government social, economic or employment policy initiative drives an obvious logic in bringing together different delivery agencies to combine to operationalise a policy decision. Sometimes partnerships can be generated at a very local level. There are examples of very successful partnerships which can be initiated at the level of municipality where various local actors identify a problem and come together voluntarily in a way to deliver a service better focused on meeting particularly local needs. Sometimes regional priorities can drive a requirement for employment services and other partners to work together. But the point is, irrespective of who is in the lead or irrespective of the origin of the partnership, partnerships can enable much more effective sharing of information. They can enable resources to be pooled. So sometimes the whole can be better than the sum of the parts. So there can be a more effective and efficient delivery of services. And a particular challenge, which was not perhaps on anybody's radar previously, can be dealt with, with all the necessary actors being on board. A classic local partnership uh, response is one where perhaps there's been a local factory plant employer closing, some local emergency having an extremely disruptive effect on the fabric of the local labour market. Sometimes partners then come together to meet that particular need and the partnership is time bound by the requirements of dealing with a particular disruption for a specific period. Can we have the next slide please Sophia? Thank you very much. Partnerships come under a great variety of models. There is an extensive literature which goes into some uh, uh, great detail in analysing different sorts of partnership typologies. But for the purposes of our discussion this afternoon, I thought I would summarise them in three overall groups. There are clearly national frameworks or strategies. This is typically where the national government decides that a certain policy agenda needs to be dealt with. And this requires the input from various public, non-governmental and perhaps private agencies. And so from the centre of government, a partnership is convened, a national framework is established. And within that national framework, actors at various levels of governance and various levels of delivery come together to deliver the regional or local response to a national framework or strategy decided by government. On other occasions, there can be a local delivery partnership as I explained just now with the previous slide, sometimes a group of actors come together because they identify a shared need and a shared interest in resolving a local problem. On these occasions, the partners will sometimes sign a partnership agreement. This is not necessarily a formal legal statement, but it can be a memorandum of understanding 
which sets the um, common goals which the partnership is seeking to achieve, and it makes very transparent and clear what the responsibilities and expectations are of different partners coming together. I think such documents are very important to make sure that everybody is operating from a shared understanding of their role and that of their partners, which again ensures that the contribution is optimised from the individual actors and agencies who are being involved. Sometimes, of course, we do have formal legal contractual partnerships. Um, these are often more frequent in a situation where there is a large commercial interest in a partner contracting with an arm of government to deliver a particular output. In uh, growing areas of employment service delivery in various parts of the world now involve private companies delivering services in partnership with uh, government. Under such arrangements, of course, then there is a commercial, trend, a commercial uh, contract drawn up governing the requirements for delivery of services and the legal framework with which the services are delivered. Contractual partnerships can be very important when there is such a kind of financial arrangement. And there are some challenges for uh, public employment providers when they're involved in such partnerships to make sure that procurement is operating in a duly diligent and effective way. There are sound in-house performance management and contract management arrangements to make sure that the public sector can monitor adequately what they are receiving. And it's an important issue for the public sector when it wants to become involved in partnerships with private providers to ensure that there is a good overview of the capacity and the delivery map across the recruitment and employment delivery horizon to make sure that there is an adequate array of service providers to deliver the services that have been sought by a contract tender for employment service delivery. If we could have the next slide, please, Sophia. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, no time to go into any detail in terms of uh, specific couple examples, country examples, apart from extremely quickly. But here I just pick out several very interesting examples for your consideration, perhaps when you want to look into more detail. Um, Colombia, a very interesting example of local uh, public employment service and private services coming together uh, with municipalities to deliver services across regions under the ambit of a national grid service model. Uh, Saudi Arabia had no employment service at all until about 10 or 15 years ago, and it contracted with one particular international company to set up an online portal for the delivery of services. Australia, back in the mid-1990s, initiated competitive contract bidding between the public and private sector for delivery of employment services based on offering a great variety of choice to any individual citizen wishing to access public employment services. And in Australia, actually now, all of the services are provided uh, by private agencies who tender for contracts to operate for a number of years. And perhaps in conclusion, in Ireland, the public sector retains responsibility for delivery of employment services for people for the first year of unemployment. But many people moving into long-term unemployment then receive their services from private contractors who bid to deliver uh, contracts tendered by the public sector. And the private providers are paid by results. So the more people they integrate into the labour market and the more people who are in furthest from integration who are moved into work, the private sector are able to generate higher profits. So there is a profit-based system to incentivise the private sector to concentrate on those farthest from employment and to effect their integration. So moving on to the next slide, please. Thank you, Sophia. Perhaps finally, and um, apologies, that was an extremely rapid run through the subject, but I had a very strict kind of time boundary of 15 minutes. But hopefully there'll be time for lots of interesting questions. Um, I think my four main takeaways from that very brief introduction are there are clearly challenges in partnership working, but if it is done successfully, it can enable networks to continue to grow and adapt and with improved coordination, resources which are dedicated to partnership working can actually act as multipliers and increase the return on investment in employment services. I think this is very interesting in the context of the growth of IT 
and interconnectivity between service providers. Um, the Public Employment Service in the Brussels region of Belgium, Actris, has now a very exciting vision looking at a potential ecosystem which could be in place by the end of the decade where an individual citizen using a digital key can enter a digital doorway where they are presented with a whole array of social and employment support service partners and they can then decide perhaps which one is most suitable for their means and the individual partners can also start to collaborate to develop their own networks within this digital geography which is very interesting. Different models and approaches are obviously appropriate for different institutional settings. I think the most important message from all areas of comparative policy study and evaluation are that every single country is different. Every country has a slightly different institutional setting, a slightly different labour market. Sometimes they are very different. Every country has a different employment situation a different macroeconomic situation and a different demography. Partnerships can be effective means for delivering services irrespective of those differences, but the partnership should obviously be shaped and designed to meet the specificities of a particular country and the particular problem which we are seeking to resolve through partnership working. Often a central leadership austere is needed from a ministry at the apex or top of government to ensure that resources can be provided to initiate a partnership and to also ensure that partnerships can operate successfully at a regional or local level. And I think my final comment would be that achieving and realising advantages from partnership working requires investment in management capacity. Partnership working depends on many factors good governance, sufficient resources, clear objectives, a well-designed mandate. But ultimately, partnership working is about people. And as in every other sphere of management and delivery and all spheres of life, actually, there are skills which are required to make these systems work effectively. And employment services developing partnerships should really think about investing in the kind of skills which make people better partnership operatives and operators and the more skilled the partnership operators are and the more that they employ the right kind of skills from whichever agency are from there is more chance of the benefits which can clearly be achieved being delivered by the partners. Um, the remaining slides are about four or five pages of um, a very extensive reading list, which I would not go through now, but of course you're at liberty to go through any of these texts. And um, if anybody has any other questions which we are not able to resolve this afternoon, I would always be delighted to exchange with any of you bilaterally with any kind of questions you may have on the subject. I hope that wasn't too rapid, but I hope I've kept the time and I hope I've given you an interesting introduction to the rest of the event. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you very much, Iman, for this rich presentation. It is a great introduction to the subject. Um, with this theoretical framework, we will start uh, going deeper, first with a, a French case, and then with a specific case from Croatia. But before presenting my the next presenter, I want to um, remind you, well, you, you know very clearly, Iman, that we have a space saved at the end of the panel to have questions and answers. And for everybody that is listening to us, uh, you can add questions in the Q&A chat. There's a little option to, to start making questions. You don't have to save them until the end. You can go, you can make them while the presenters are talking and we will gather them and then we will make the questions at the end of the panels. So thank you very much, Iman. Now I'm going to change to Spanish to present our next panelist. Ahora sí, en español, eh, muchas gracias, Claire. Bienvenida. Claire del Campo es Claire Arenales del Campo nos va a compartir cómo se trabaja la gestión de alianzas en Pol Emploi, el Servicio Público de Empleo de Francia. Claire es jefe del equipo de movilidad internacional de Pol Emploi. Trabajó por 10 años en el desarrollo internacional de pequeñas y medianas empresas industriales francesas. Después de eso, se incorporó en Pol Emploi, donde trabaja desde hace 15 años. Actualmente trabaja en el Departamento de Movilidad Internacional 
como responsable de un equipo de asesores encargados de apoyar a los solicitantes de empleo que desean trasladarse al extranjero. Así que sin más, muchas gracias, Claire. Bienvenida y es todo tuyo el espacio. Buenos días a todos desde París. Uh, voy a compartir mi presentación ahora. Entonces voy a, a hablar un poco de cómo funcionan las alianzas en Pôle emploi en Francia. Y gracias al señor Daber por la introducción, porque es realmente el concepto y yo voy a explicar un poco cómo se hace concretamente en nuestro servicio público de empleo. Con pues algunas um, cosas un poco teoríticas para empezar y dos ejemplos para, para concluir. Entonces tenemos tres prioridades cuando se habla de gestión de alianzas en Pôle emploi. La primera cosa es cualificar y promover servicios desarrollados por los socios y realmente la noción de complementarios a los de Pôle emploi, porque hay, muchos, hay muchas alianzas que pueden proponer servicios iguales a los de Pôle emploi, lo que buscamos en, en nuestros socios y en nuestras alianzas es realmente la complementariedad para que sea el más interesante y puede beneficiar a nuestros usuarios. Uh, segundo es establecer y desarrollar colaboraciones para acelerar la reincorporación al mercado laboral. Es decir que algunos desempleados pues tienen problemas no solamente para incorporarse en el mercado laboral, sino problemas personales um, de alojamiento, de cuidar los niños, pues cosas que pueden realmente ser obstáculos a su reincorporación al mercado laboral. Entonces buscamos alianzas también para ayudarnos sobre estos temas. Y la tercera la tercera prioridad es impulsar colaboraciones que permitan pues, superar estos obstáculos para el empleo. Uh, y entonces tenemos dos ejes de intervención, la cooperación para la inclusión laboral y también la cooperación para la inclusión territorial. Es decir, que hay realmente dos maneras de, de, de manejar la cooperación. La primera cosa es cuidarse de los desempleados y asegurarnos que nuestros servicios y los servicios de nuestras alianzas permiten mejorar la reincorporación al mercado laboral y también asegurarnos que todos los servicios sean disponibles al nivel local, al nivel de los territorios y no solamente hacer alianzas nacionales, sino realmente que, que esas alianzas existen en cada, en cada ciudad realmente, en cada barrio, um, para todos los usuarios que lo necesitan. Entonces, hacemos nuestra estrategia con un diagnóstico territorial, con todos los, los socios que tenemos en, en la, los territorios, sobre la, el diagnóstico que se hace sobre la base de las necesidades de los territorios, porque las necesidades de una ciudad como París son muy diferentes de las necesidades de las montañas, por ejemplo. Y entonces buscamos tres principios uh, transversales, favorecer la accesibilidad de todos los servicios de Pôle emploi, desarrollar la complementariedad de los servicios también y contribuir a las políticas de inserción profesional, depende de las necesidades de cada territorio. Um, nuestra oferta de servicio en Pôle emploi debe limitarse al ámbito de, del empleo, pero la cooperación permite también salir un poco de, de este ámbito un poco estricto para poder uh, tomar en cuenta obstáculos como lo hemos visto antes. También la cooperación se hace siempre en respecto de la igualdad entre hombres y mujeres, la igualdad de oportunidades y no discriminación, como 
todas las acciones uh, que hacemos en Pueblo Emploi. Para hablar un poco concretamente de cómo se gestionan la, las alianzas en Pueblo Emploi, hay un departamento que se encarga de las, uh, la gestión de alianzas con 33 empleados en la dirección general. Por supuesto, hay también empleados de Pueblo Emploi que se encargan de alianzas en las regiones, hay, hay 16 regiones en Francia y hay direcciones re regionales, eh, en cada uno hay empleados que se encargan de alianzas. Eh, en la dirección general hay tres departamentos de cooperación, uno para la integración de ciudadanos, realmente pa para los desempleados, un departamento para los territorios inclusivos y otro departamento para las relaciones con los cargos electos. También eso es, es uh, también un, una cuestión de, de política y entonces uh, tenemos uh, compañeros que se encargan de este. Tres preguntas importantes. ¿Cómo elegimos a nuestros socios? La primera cosa que es muy importante para Pueblo Emploi es que ten, tienen que proponer servicios gratuitos que sea para Pueblo Emploi, para los usuarios o para las empresas. Eso es realmente uh, muy importante. Podemos hacer una alianza con Google, pero Google tendría, tendría que hacer un servicio gratuito uh, que sea, por ejemplo, talleres para desempleados, pues tienen que ser gratuitos. Um, y el segundo punto importante es la eficacia. Para nuestros usuarios tenemos que elegir a socios uh, que proponen servicios um, realmente eficaz para todos los usuarios y en complementariedad con los nuestros. ¿Cómo evaluamos el rendimiento de nuestros socios? Pues eh, tratamos de hacer mmm, como una contabilidad, es decir, saber el número de demandantes de empleo o el número de empresas que acceden al servicio de este socio. Eh, pues eso es, es importante. Y segundo, la utilidad del servicio en términos de retorno al empleo o de contratación, si es para empresas, eh, es siempre pensándolo en una noción de combinación de trayectorias. Eh, como lo ha dicho el señor Daber, no, de, no, no es una cuestión de hacer todos los mismos, hay doble encompanamiento, sino eh, hacer una combinación de trayectorias. Y tercera pregunta, ¿cómo formalizamos nuestras asociaciones? Uh, pues no hay firma sistemática de un acuerdo muy formal. Uh, tenemos que plantearnos dos preguntas sobre la, la firma de un convenio. Primeramente, ¿cuál es el tipo de alianza? Es, si es nacional, si es regional o local. Si es nacional, se puede firmar un acuerdo y después hay una aplicación regional y local del, del acuerdo, del convenio. Y segunda pregunta, ¿cuál es la, el valor añadido para nuestros usar, usuarios? Si no hay un valor añadido en firmar un, un contrato, un convenio, pues eh, podemos hacer simplemente lo que llamamos hojas de ruta, eh, donde hacemos el plan de acciones del año y cómo vamos a seguir las acciones, pero puede ser muy, muy simple de esta forma. Yo hablaré un poco más tarde en la conclusión de France Travail. Es el, es el proyecto del gobierno francés para cambiar un poco eh, la manera de organizar los servicios de empleo en Francia. La idea es reunir a todos los actores del empleo en Francia entre un mismo techo. Y desde el punto de vista de, esta, de este proyecto, los los, uh, las alianzas es algo muy importante porque es realmente la idea de, de este proyecto de France Travail, es hacer que las alianzas trabajen mejor uh, entre ellas. Um, unos, unos números, hay 62 convenciones nacionales entre Pueblo Emploi y sus socios y más de 3.000 convenciones regionales y locales. Uh, pueden ser con muy pequeñas asociaciones o con grupos un poco más uh, importantes. Uh, 
se puede ver aquí la coordinación de los actores del servicio público de empleo. Segundo, nuestra contribución a la aplicación de las políticas ministeriales, así se puede ver las alianzas con todos los ministerios con los cuales trabajamos y también la, la idea de trabajar con los territorios uh, y la proximidad con las autoridades locales y sus selectos. Por ejemplo, uh, los consejos departamentales. En Francia la, las regiones tienen departamentos y uh, hay muchas, um, muchos servicios que se dan al nivel departamental. Eso es un poco, es un poco lo mismo. No, Quizás uh, vosotros pod pueden leerle más tarde. Uh, voy a, a pasar y a explicar un poco un ejemplo de alianza. Es um, una alianza que ha dado um, esta herramienta que se llama PIX. PIX es una herramienta digital para evaluar y certificar 16 competencias digitales. Es una herramienta que existe desde hace unos años ahora y que es muy útil para un público muy, muy amplio, alumnos, estudiantes, desempleados, adultos también en formación profesional. Pues vosotros pueden tomar el, el test de PIX y fue desarrollado por muy varios socios, um, diferentes ministerios también universidades, la UNESCO también fue, um, uh, fue tomó parte de, de este proyecto, centros de formaciones públicos para adultos y realmente es, es, es una herramienta que fue uh, desarrollada en una idea muy común y que puede ser útil desde como 6, 7 años hasta 50 o 60 años y que da realmente una certificación a las personas que, que pasan este test. Por ejemplo, en, en Francia, para obtener el, el equivalente del bachillerato uh, antes de irse a la universidad, los alumnos tienen que tener las certificaciones PICS, si no, uh, pues no pueden ir a la universidad. Así que es, es, fue desarrollado y algo que tiene ahora una importancia muy concreta. El sitio web que se puede ver aquí es disponible en inglés también si, si alguno para alguno de, de vosotros quieren ver un poco más. Otro ejemplo de alianza internacional, quizás um, vosotros ya conocéis al red EURES. EURES significa European Employment Services. Uh, so, es, es el, el red que, re, que reúne 30 servicios públicos de empleos de Europa, entonces la 27 de la Unión Europea y tres más que también forman parte de este red. El objetivo de red que tendrá 30 años en 2024 es facilitar la circulación de trabajadores en, en Europa, dentro de Europa. Y entonces es, es una alianza de, de todos los servicios públicos, pero también de actores privados, como por ejemplo empresas de trabajo temporal. Creo que mi compañera de Croacia puede hablar un poco de eso, porque creo que también en Croacia uh, hay empresas de trabajo temporal que forman parte de Red Eures. Y para explicar un poco más uh, cómo un socio um, es miembro de EURES, hay que prestar al menos uno de esos tres servicios, contribuir a la reserva de ofertas de empleo, porque la idea de Red EURES y del sitio web de Red EURES es compartir, es reunir todas las ofertas de empleo de los 30 países, así que hay más, más que 4 millones de ofertas disponibles cada día. También contribuir, contribuir a, a la reserva de solicitudes de empleo de candidatos y de CV para las empresas que están buscando personal. Y tercera servicio es proporcionar, 
eh, apoyo directamente a los solicitantes de empleo o a las empresas también que están buscando eh, empleadores. Así que es un ejemplo de, de una alianza pues eh, desde hace mucho tiempo, eh, muy concreta y que está gestionada por la Comisión Europeana eh, por la, la autoridad, eh, ahora la autoridad del, del labor eh, en Bratislava. Y entonces es, eh, es un, pues, una alianza muy eficaz. Um, en conclusión, lo que podemos decir es que en Francia, en el contexto actual de la transición hacia la nueva organización France Travail, que, que empezará el año próximo normalmente, eh, cuya ambición es reunir a todos los agentes de empleo bajo un mismo, bajo un mismo techo. La, la cuestión realmente de nuestras asociaciones está en el centro de todas las, reflex, las reflexiones, eh, que sea reflexión sobre los servicios reflexión sobre los sistemas informáticos, reflexión sobre los recursos humanos, pues realmente todos, la, todos los temas tenemos que, que tomar en cuenta. Y la búsqueda de complementariedad, eh, la, ya lo hemos dicho, la medición de la eficacia de las, de las asociaciones y de nuestros socios es algo muy importante. Y el acceso a los servicios de los socios. La idea también de France Travail es dar acceso um, a nuestros usuarios a los servicios de, de socios, aunque sean muy pequeños. Es la idea porque los servicios de Pôle emploi son muy fáciles de eh, tener para cada uno en Francia, pero ¿cómo podemos dar acceso a servicios menos conocidos pero muy interesantes a todos los usuarios y a todos los que necesitan um, beneficiar de este servicio. Y creo que mi tiempo ya... Sí, gracias exacto. a todos. <risa> Muchas gracias. Espero que fue uh, interesante para vosotros y pues si hay preguntas al final. Eso, Mucho sin gusto. duda. Sí, sí, y muchas gracias, gracias Claire. Y sí fue la, la cantidad de preguntas que se han ido haciendo en, en el chat, nos demuestra que sí fuiste levantando interés. Entonces, muchísimas gracias por la presentación. Ahora, nada más les recuerdo que en el chat, en la parte de Q&A, pueden hacer preguntas, las vamos a atender al final de los tres, de los paneles que nos quedan y las pueden ir haciendo desde ahora, no se tienen que esperar a que sea al final para escribirlas, las pueden ir haciendo y al final nosotros las compilamos y se las hacemos a los panelistas que correspondan. Voy a cambiar a inglés para presentar a nuestra próxima panelista y muchísimas gracias Claire por esta presentación súper interesante. Nos pasamos al inglés. Um, our next panelist is Cristina Mazalin. Cristina is from Croatia and she will share a best partnership management case from her country, from Croatia. Cristina works as a senior expert advisor in the Croatian Employment Service Central Office in Zagreb. She is the CISOC, now she will say, if I'm saying it correctly, um, in the CISOC project coordinator. CISOC is a lifelong career guidance center and it is a case study that she will be sharing with us today. She is also involved in the implementation of active labor market policy measures in the department. And previously, she worked in the Public Employment Service, Public Relations and International Cooperation Department as a support in establishing and maintaining regional cooperation. She organized and coordinated various programs and also supported in establishing agreements and projects with other countries and institutions. Thank you very much, Cristina, for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sophia, uh, and everybody else. I want to, first of all, wish you all a warm welcome or hello from Zagreb. Um, I would just like to start my presentation. So uh, as Sophia has um, introduced uh, my today's presentation that I'm going to uh, give you is the case study of a good example of practice that we have in our employment service, and that is the uh, Lifelong Career Guidance Center's 
uh, also abbreviated or as we call them TSOC centers. So just briefly, I would like to uh, start uh, with the content of this presentation. I will just try to be very succinct, but brief. And then at the end, you can also always ask me additional questions. Uh, so I will just introduce, first of all, Croatian labor market or Croatia to uh, say that we are at a specific position in Europe. We are at the crossroads between uh, Central and uh, Southeastern Europe. So we are a small country of uh, 3.8 million inhabitants, but we are very diverse, both geographically and uh, economically. So that's also something uh, that we take into consideration when we build uh, partnerships in different parts of Croatia. So here you can just um, have a summary of the current situation on the Croatian labor market. For example, the active population uh, in labor force uh, or the unemployment rate, which is currently around 7%. Uh, so we're close to the European average regarding that and specifically to the, today's topic and that is need persons. So uh, we have um, for example, in the age bracket from 15 to 24, we have 14% uh, of uh, unemployed, registered unemployment. Or, and uh, when we extend that bracket to 29 years, it's 25.5% uh, registered unemployment. Of course, uh, we have um, uh, our uh, Croatian employment service established throughout uh, the country. So we have uh, 22 centers or uh, regional offices, the central office situated in the capital Zagreb, and then we have uh, 99 uh, smaller local offices, which is very important to bring that accessibility of services that our previous speakers have uh, uh, mentioned before. And uh, we have 16 uh, so far uh, TSOC centers, um, and uh, we are also opening them continuously through this project that we have. So what does our uh, employment service do? We, of course, have, as uh, I'm sure other employment services throughout the world, we have a uh, main task to develop the market, to tackle the unemployment, provide uh, unemployment benefits. Uh, we work uh, specifically to, towards achieving full employment, and that is by deliver, delivering uh, various measures, uh, labor market measures. We have education. A training measures and of course through all of that processes is uh, 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 the support mechanism or providing career guidance services to all citizens is what's embedded in supporting all of that. So a little bit about lifelong career guidance system in uh, Republic of Croatia. Uh, it is uh, the system that is um, well uh, recognized between uh, both education and employment uh, legislative or framework. But what's uh, important to emphasize here that in uh, our Croatian employment service, uh, the lifelong career guidance has uh, started uh, uh, in 1931. So we have a very long tradition of providing services and uh, uh, we are also just, I think this is the reason why we recognize as a good uh, a practice, practice example. And um, so what is the aim? The aim is to, of course, minimize the number of early school leavers to uh, increase the um, participants in tertiary education and de decrease the exclusion, social exclusion and um, the risk of, of course, poverty. One of the main things that I would like to also uh, point out here is that we have a very low um, uh, number percentage of early school uh, school leavers, which I would contribute to great partnership with our uh, education sector, specifically uh, with our Ministry um, of Education and Science, uh, because we have embedded uh, career guidance practices for um, for our pupils and students from the earliest of age through various acts, and we provide services from. Uh, as I said, the earliest age to them. And then we have a very high, high rate of uh, tertiary uh, yearly enrollment. Uh, the latest data sh says that it's around 68%, which is also something that we contribute to uh, the, uh, the preventive measures, but also the stimulating measures that we 
uh, provide through the, through our local uh, offices, but also the CISOC centers to pupils, students, and of course other um, uh, stakeholders. So uh, career guidance services are provided uh, 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 through our offices and centers, and uh, the expert advisors that work in this department, they're mostly psychologists uh, or pedagogists, but also uh, they can be from a social work background uh, and similar. This is um, um, the organization of the uh, career guidance and counseling. So on the ministry level, we have a forum for lifelong guidance and career development. Uh, so we have a great established partnership with them and that um, uh, gathers together all the uh, stakeholders in the field of lifelong career guidance. And we think this is uh, very important because it enables the development of uh, adequate policies, measures and activities so that it can uh, be then um, dispersed through different avenues um, of um, uh, partnerships or on the different levels, for example, in education, it can be implemented or uh, through, uh, in our case, employment uh, service. Uh, we, uh, we provide the services in our offices and uh, CISOC centers and they differ somehow. So uh, in our offices, we pro provide mostly them uh, to uh, primary and secondary school students. The, so the students can get written recommendations for school enrollment. Uh, and those are primarily given to students who are at risk. They have uh, a prior health and social problems, learning difficulties, and uh, et cetera. And also unemployed persons, uh, young uh, uh, job seekers, employers, and we provide them with, uh, they can access services such as psychological testing, interviewing, and they also can get written opinions um, for various uh, education or continuing training, etc. Uh, whereas in CISOC centers, the main users are um, primary school, uh, uh, primary and secondary school students, but those are undecided ones uh, and that are not so much at risk, uh, but, is, but we also provide uh, uh, services to them if they need information, how to continue or what to program to enroll. Also then students and graduates, uh, or especially when they're entering uh, the labor market for the first time. And uh, of course the needs, the, the, the very uh, uh, at risk uh, group. Also then to counselor, counselors, other counselors that are participating in career guidance, for example, from universities and then parents. And also we collaborate uh, uh, with private and public uh, sector partners uh, where we sign agreements with uh, defined activities, what uh, what kind of activities would uh, we contribute and they would contribute also. So, so far we have around uh, 460 written agreements with partners. So just to present you the CISOC centers a little bit more, uh, they were first developed in 2013 when uh, Croatia was ascending to European Union through a project. And uh, since then, it has, it, they have been continuously uh, opening throughout the Croatia. And uh, currently we have also the project that is ongoing and that, that is um, placing a role on uh, attracting needs. And that is uh, uh, this is a big project that is financed through the European Union um, uh, Recovery Fund, which is created when uh, as a response to COVID crisis when it started. So what we are going to do is that we're going to straighten furthermore the capacities of our services, uh, establish new centers, as I said, uh, develop new uh, standards where we also were going to uh, strengthen and define the more uh, uh, partnership uh, rules. And we are also going to promote and uh, uh, make CISOC centers more visible to a wider population. So why are CISOC centers a good example uh, practice um, for delivering services to needs? So we think because uh, as we said, the uh, basis uh, for the work of CISOC centers is uh, partnership based. Uh, they're recognizable 
uh, because they deliver good quality services to all citizens. They're free of charge. They're dislocated from the um, premises of the regional offices and uh, public empo employment uh, set, uh, set, uh, centers. And this is good because sometimes with public employment services, there can, there can be negative connotations. So the CISOC centers provide uh, a kind of a more uh, uh, accepting place where for especially need persons can feel free to uh, con contact our counselors and, uh, and um, ask them for any kind of advice regarding their career. Uh, also, we have a comprehensive uh, ICIT support. We constantly develop new online tools and instruments to reach to the greatest uh, possible number of clients. So just to present you the partnerships uh, that we uh, are today talking about, and it is uh, NEEDS, and this is an initiative that is established on the EU level. It is called the Youth Guarantee. So this uh, youth guarantee has been first established uh, in 2013, and since then it has been implemented uh, in the policies in various uh, public employment services throughout the Europe and so in Croatia. So what is the purpose? The purpose is to ensure that uh, public employment services and act actors or partners uh, offer good quality uh, of, uh, of employment uh, or further education or apprenticeships and traineeships to the persons aged 15 to 29 uh, within the four months of them becoming unemployed or completing their education, also known as need persons. So uh, in Croatia, this uh, youth guarantee uh, is coordinated, uh, the, the campaign is coordinated by the Ministry of Labor, Pension System, Family and Social Policy. Uh, it's funded, of course, through the European Social Fund and now European Social Fund Plus. Uh, and this campaign has the aim to raise the awareness about the uh, uh, youth guarantee and strengthen the institutional implementation capacities. So we have written the agreement of cooperation, uh, of cooperation between our ministry. And of course, we have uh, also written the, uh, the other signer is the uh, Croatian Pension Insurance Institute. So what do we do uh, in regards to need in TISOX? Uh, well, first, it's important to distinguish that we have active and inactive needs. Active needs are those uh, that register at our service, and inactive needs are those that are not registered. And those are the main uh, target group that come to TISOC centers for services. So we have a, in TISOC centers, we have around 45,000 of services per year, and 60% of the clients are people who are aged 15 to 29. Uh, age. So the current need rate in Croatia is 14.9%. And uh, in you, it's around 13.1%. So I would like to say that uh, uh, different activities are uh, designed to make the outreach and activation of need people uh, most effective possible. So when they uh, come to Croatian employment services or CISOC centers, of course, uh, we can give them through lifelong learning uh, measures or career guidance. We can um, we can kind of direct them towards education and training measures that we have, or uh, we can um, refer them to uh, specific uh, partnerships that we have with employers as well. So maybe for the traineeships. Um, also, with something that we have introduced recently is a uh, training uh, measure or audit education measure for digital and green skills uh, through the vouchers. And the aim, of course, is to enhance their employability uh, and offer them good quality employment as soon as possible. And uh, they can also find all the information that we provide. And we think this is very important through our online services and tools. So we have a micro portal uh, for CISOC, we have e-guidance portal where they can find a different kind of uh, self-help tools, for example, a career plan, uh, interest and competencies. Uh, of course, uh, as Claire uh, has mentioned, we also can uh, help them write uh, a CV for the Euros, uh, uh, Europass uh, uh, 
uh, form and then can apply for maybe internships or employment abroad. Uh, so just a little bit about uh, lessons learned and our future plans. So we are working on establishing new enhancing existing partnerships. So it's important to keep in mind the regional differences because in different parts of Croatia, uh, they're not, uh, the, the youth is not, uh, um, uh, for example, they don't have the same problems as in, in the others. So especially it's important to enhance uh, the partnerships with uh, employers and youth centers so far, we are uh, very well uh, co collaborating with them, but we think it's more important to uh, put on paper all the activities and to define them more because sometimes the agreements can be too uh, um, not not uh, not in detail. Is what I want to say. Uh, also, uh, based on the agreement that I've mentioned before between the ministries and Function Institute. Uh, we can uh, use it for data exchange between institutions. Uh, and then when we exchange data, for example, for needs, we can track them one year from when they have uh, uh, exited education and then beca became unemployed and they're not included anywhere. And then we can see in which uh, regions of Croatia uh, they are situated and deliver targeted actions through uh, sign agreements, for example, with NGOs or employers in that areas. And then, of, of course, monitor all that uh, through one year period and see uh, how many agreements have been written, what kind of activities have been, been delivered, and what is the uh, end result of, of all that, what is the productivity. So, as I mentioned, the uh, mapping of the availability of services. And then uh, also we, through the, through the pr uh, process of all of that and developing new services, we need to keep in mind that we need to first uh, 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 communicate all that information to need. So we need to reach them. And how we can do that is that we need to be present, uh, for example, in, on social media. We need to have uh, videos, video material, and we need to have um, new online services, which we are currently working on. For example, we're going to, we're going to have uh, uh, different modules. For example, for TSOC, we're going to have also a module where we're going to track every agreement well, we have written, every activity. So uh, we will have that uh, very well listed and uh, uh, the users will be very um, uh, active uh, activated in that way because they will uh, be uh, presented with online uh, education. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. Okay, we have one one yeah. minute uh, left. If you want to wrap up, yeah. Basically, this is the end of my presentation. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. I just wanted to uh, uh, for the uh, for the end of this presentation said. Uh, uh, say that uh, this is the ongoing process and we, we're constantly uh, developing new services because uh, even if, if we do have a good result, uh, that doesn't mean that we're going to have them in the future if we just uh, don't develop. And I would like to thank you. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Christina, for the for the presentation. Um, remember that we have the Q&A section uh, below. You can make the questions. And at the end, we will have time for the panelists to answer the questions. And also for the panelists, you can also check the questions. And in some cases, you can answer directly to the person if you think it, it corresponds. Um, now, uh, I'm going to switch to Spanish to present our next panelist. Ahora tengo el gusto de presentar a Andrés Franco. Andrés es el coordinador de la red CEALC y nos va a hacer una presentación breve de cuáles son los servicios de la red, cómo se pueden aliar a, a la red CEALC y también cuáles son las principales actividades que tenemos este año. Andrés. Gracias, Sofía. Buenos días y muchas gracias a mis colegas que ya hicieron la presentación y a todos los que están conectados. Voy a tratar de ser muy breve. Eh, haciendo esta presentación de lo que hemos eh, diseñado y lo que hemos trabajado para este año, ¿no? las actividades que tenemos desde la red CEAL, que es la red de apoyo técnico a los servicios de empleo de América Latina y el Caribe, y creemos que era muy pertinente sacar este espacio aprovechando la oportunidad que estamos hablando de gestión de alianzas para contarle a nuestros socios eh, qué tenemos para ellos y cómo se pueden beneficiar de esta red CEAL. 
muy brevemente, contarles que la red SEAL desde el 2009, eh, su principal misión siempre ha sido fortalecer los servicios públicos de empleo de la región a través de talleres, capacitaciones, intercambios, y trabajamos siempre por convertirnos en los aliados eh, digamos, más importantes regionales que tienen los servicios públicos de empleo en América Latina y el Caribe. En el 2019 eh, hicimos parte o nos convertimos ahora en un bien público regional y fue una oportunidad para la red eh, para reinventarse y actualizarse y agregar nuevos temas que no estamos viendo antes, como eh, la transformación digital, eh, temas de migración y empleos verdes. Entonces, eh, a partir del 2021, la red eh, se reinventa y también eh, con el apoyo eh, de un comité directivo que se crea en este año, conformado por los países de Chile, Colombia y Ecuador, intentamos... Eh, lograr cubrir, digamos, que todas esas necesidades que tienen nuestros miembros, como para, a partir de esas necesidades, generar las actividades que les vamos a mostrar. Actualmente somos 17 países, cubrimos básicamente casi toda la región de América Latina y el Caribe, desde México hasta Argentina, pero seguimos trabajando para que algunos países que aún no son miembros de la red SEAL, pues se puedan unir eh, a nuestra red. Como estamos hablando de socios aliados, les quería presentar muy brevemente que nosotros no solo tenemos unos socios eh, internos o a nivel regional, sino que también hemos construido una red bastante importante y fortalecida fuera de la región. En esta slide ven algunos de ellos, no solo son servicios públicos de empleo eh, de los, eh, más desarrollados eh, de Europa y de Asia, sino que también tenemos aliados algunas eh, instituciones internacionales como la, la OCTE, la OIT y también la Asociación Mundial de los Servicios Públicos de Empleo, para mencionar algunos. ¿Cuáles son los beneficios de ser parte de la red? Básicamente, eh, esta es una red de transferencia de conocimiento. Los países que hacen parte, específicamente los servicios públicos que hacen parte de esta red SEAL eh, de los países miembros, eh, pueden utilizar diferentes recursos y estos recursos y estos talleres e iniciativas que nosotros proponemos y brindamos desde la red SEAL son gratuitos eh, para los servicios públicos de empleo y digamos que el costo de ser parte de esta red es el, el tiempo que ponen, digamos, todas las personas que hacen parte de los servicios públicos de empleo para conectarse en estas actividades. Eh, esta actividad es, es, es un caso vivo de ello. Tenemos cinco beneficios que quisieran eh, contarles rápidamente. El primero de estos y por el que estamos trabajando, impulsando este 2023 eh, con mayor fuerza, es la provisión de asistencias técnicas con expertos de servicios públicos de empleo más desarrollados fuera de la región, en donde el servicio público de empleo, que es miembro de la red SEALC, tenga la oportunidad de eh, identificar uno de sus mayores eh, problemas, obstáculos, y a partir de ahí contactar a la red SEALC para que nosotros podamos eh, conseguir un servicio público de empleo fuera de la región o algún experto que pueda trabajar y con construir una hoja de ruta para ayudarles a solucionar estos obstáculos. Y ya hablaré un poco más eh, a detalle eh, más adelante en la presentación. La segunda, nos gusta promover eh, la participación de estudios eh, técnicos, intercambios de conocimiento, webinarios y talleres. Eh, y también como parte de la red de estos beneficios a los que los invitamos es eh, el tema de capacitaciones para funcionarios de servicios públicos de empleo. Antiguamente, la red hacía estos cursos y estos workshops de manera presencial. Tuvimos que parar por la pandemia, pero a partir del año pasado estamos tratando de reinventarnos y ver cómo podemos generar cursos virtuales con base o a partir de las necesidades de los servicios públicos de empleo que son miembros y eh, les voy a contar cómo las personas que están aquí conectadas, miembros de los servicios públicos de empleo, nos pueden ayudar ¿no? a identificar esas necesidades y nosotros construir eh, y diseñar estos cursos para ustedes. Finalmente, nos, nos gusta promover también y creemos que es súper importante eh, generar cooperación entre los países de la región ¿no? para transferir conocimiento. El año pasado, eh, el Servicio Público de Empleo, por lo menos de Perú, eh, quien estuvo eh, mejorando su bolsa de inteligencia artificial con la implementación, perdón, su bolsa de trabajo con la implementación de inteligencia artificial, ¿no? tuvo un intercambio con los colegas del Ministerio de Trabajo y del Servicio Público de Empleo de Colombia que están trabajando en una plataforma muy parecida. También los colegas eh, de Perú invitaron a varios colegas eh, de Chile para hacer un intercambio eh, de temas correspondientes al servicio público de empleo. Entonces eso es, es algo que nosotros hacemos y queremos que nos vean como un puente para que nosotros los podamos acercar ¿no? eh, internamente. Y finalmente, gracias a toda esta experiencia, gracias a todas estas actividades, pues la red SEAL ha venido consolidando una red de expertos eh, que están a disposición de los servicios públicos de empleo que son parte de nuestra red eh, y que con mucho gusto nosotros podemos ayudarles a identificar a estos expertos si en algún momento precisan de, de una necesidad que se acerquen a nosotros y nosotros podemos acercar eh, a estos profesionales. 
No financiamos nosotros desde la red CEALC intercambios eh, y viajes y visitas, por lo menos de servicios públicos de empleo fuera de la región, pero sí a través de las asistencias técnicas podemos traer estos expertos y estos servicios públicos de empleo a la región y a los servicios públicos de empleo que tengan una necesidad puntual y que nos pidan una asistencia técnica. Tenemos varias actividades, eh, como mencionaba al principio, eh, para este 2023, pero voy a mencionar solo seis actividades que consideramos las, las más eh, importantes y quizás las más estratégicas. El primero de ellos es que vamos a seguir continuando con esta red, eh, perdón, con esta serie de webinarios que venimos eh, promoviendo desde el 2020, que iniciamos con la pandemia y hoy se ha venido transformando y evolucionando y, y nos gusta cubrir diferentes eh, tópicos a partir de la demanda del servicio público de empleo. Esta serie de webinarios intentamos hacerlo por lo menos una vez cada mes e invitamos a los servicios públicos de empleo, miembros de la red, a que si tienen alguna inquietud o si quieren proponer temas ¿no? que sean de su interés para que nosotros eh, logremos eh, reunir expertos para hablar de ese tema, lo pueden hacer o a través del correo electrónico que más adelante les voy a dejar eh, mis datos de contacto o a través de la página de la red SEAL donde tenemos una encuesta y pueden dejar ahí todas sus inquietudes y con mucho gusto intentaremos trabajar para eh, seguir eh, profundizando y fortaleciendo estos temas y estos webinarios. El segundo de ellos, como ya les había comentado, es la promoción de asistencias técnicas y aquí quisiera eh, agradecer públicamente al SNE de México porque el año pasado nos ayudó con una asistencia técnica eh, para Haití, Haití está en este momento eh, creando una plataforma digital de intermediación laboral, México tenía, eh, digamos, un camino importante recorrido, así que bueno, acudimos a los colegas del SNE de México y pudimos llevar a cabo eh, esta promoción de asistencia técnica. Y con esto quiero animar a los eh, servicios públicos de empleo que si tienen alguna necesidad puntual, visiten nuestra página web, puedan descargar el formulario que ya les voy a mostrar eh, y de esta manera pues sacarle provecho ¿no? a estas actividades de la red CEALC. En cuanto a cursos y talleres, este año estamos diseñando, ya hemos diseñado una encuesta que queremos lanzar eh, en las próximas semanas para los servicios públicos de empleo con el objetivo de identificar cuáles son estas necesidades de conocimiento. Uno de los mayores problemas que tenemos, eh, obstáculos, lo llamaría yo, dentro de los servicios públicos de empleo de gran parte de la región de América Latina y el Caribe es la rotación ¿no? de los funcionarios y algunos consejeros de los servicios públicos de empleo. Entonces la idea es construir... Eh, cursos que se ajusten a esas necesidades, que sean asincrónicos y que sean virtuales para eh, poder estar formando y capacitando ¿no? a nuestros funcionarios de los servicios públicos de empleo con eh, o de la mano de expertos eh, extrarregionales que están mucho más avanzados. Eh, ya para cerrar las actividades, les cuento que también desde el 2019 estamos eh, haciendo una, eh, implementando un toolkit para evaluar cuál es el funcionamiento de los servicios públicos de empleo eh, y ver dónde el servicio público de empleo podría eh, o debería, digamos, apostarle y, y cuáles son esas actividades que de pronto podrían mejorar y fortalecer. Lo hemos hecho ya en cuatro países de la región y la idea es que eh, este toolkit lo podamos aplicar en el mediano plazo a todos los, los miembros de los servicios públicos de empleo. Y la red SEAL no solamente eh, transfiere conocimiento, sino que también crea su propio conocimiento. Este año también estamos trabajando en construir la segunda versión o en publicar la segunda versión del mundo de los servicios públicos eh, de empleo. Eh, y estamos trabajando para incluir nuevos temas en esta publicación, como empleos verdes, transformación digital, migración, eh, temas de equidad y género. Entonces, eh, Nada, con los, nuestros socios aliados de la OCDE y, y WAVES eh, queremos sacar una muy buena publicación que les sirva a ustedes ¿no? este material de consulta. Y finalmente, eh, el año pasado ustedes hicieron parte de una encuesta eh, de madurez digital eh, que hicimos en 15 países miembros de la red y este año esperamos sacar esta nota técnica, hacer un webinar y compartirles también esta, esta nota eh, informativa técnica para que ustedes eh, puedan eh, utilizarla y consultarla y aprovechar este conocimiento. Eh, no me voy a extender mucho porque sé que hay muy buenas preguntas, simplemente contarles que la asistencia técnica en nuestra página web eh, está todo el procedimiento de, de, de cómo pedirla, eh, estas presentaciones eh, y estas grabaciones van a estar dentro de la página web, así que eh, si alguno de ustedes quiere consultar después este video, si quiere consultar después la presentación de alguno de nuestros panelistas, no solo de este webinario, sino de los anteriores, lo pueden encontrar en nuestra página web, que también funciona como repositorio de información. Finalmente, aquí se va a tomar un minuto para contarles que, eh, y, re, y reafirmarles el, el, eh, la encuesta que estamos sacando a partir de la, de la próxima semana, eh, este año, eh, y hablando también justo de las alianzas, eh, queremos aliarnos con la Agencia Federal de Empleo de Alemania 
para sacar eh, estos cursos eh, y estas, estas cápsulas eh, virtuales, pero es muy importante para nosotros saber cuáles son esos temas y cuáles son esas prioridades que tienen los diferentes servicios públicos de empleo. Así que nada, les vamos a estar invitando a participar de una encuesta de cinco minutos y a partir de ahí vamos a identificar estas necesidades. Las estaremos enviando al director del servicio público de empleo y les estaremos pidiendo a los directores del servicio público de empleo que por favor nos ayuden eh, a de, eh, diseminar esta encuesta corta eh, para que tengamos la mayor cantidad de respuestas posibles y así poder tener un material suficiente para crear estos contenidos con los profesionales del Servicio Público de Empleo de Alemania y eh, con los profesores que hacen parte de esta universidad que tiene el Servicio Público de Empleo de Alemania. Esto lo haremos a partir de la semana del 13 de marzo, así que les agradecemos su colaboración. También ya para cerrar, eh, mis datos van a quedar colgados en la presentación. Si tienen alguna duda, eh, me pueden escribir a mí o hacerlo a través de... Eh, los especialistas eh, de la división de mercados laborales que también están a su disposición en cada uno de sus países eh, del BID y nos pueden eh, también eh, contactar a través eh, de ellos. Solo para cerrar, me, 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 me queda nada más que agradecerles y también decirles que si eh, están interesados en seguir participando en estos webinarios y no están todavía en la lista de invitaciones, me pueden enviar un mail con las personas que ustedes quieren que nosotros invitemos del, del Servicio Público de Empleo para que les llegue mes a mes eh, digamos eh, en sus calendarios estas invitaciones a nuestros webinarios con esto cierro, eh, muchas gracias Sofía y, y te doy el paso para que abramos la sesión de preguntas y respuestas Muchísimas gracias Andrés por la explicación, ahora sí vamos a aprovechar los minutos que tenemos para eh, revisar algunas de las respuestas que han llegado vamos a empezar por las que los panelistas, ellos seleccionaron algunas que, que querían responder. Entonces voy a empezar por esas. Eh, voy a cambiar a inglés porque la primera es para Imun. Um, so Imun, the first question that we will answer uh, is one that, that you said that you wanted to, to address. It was made by Yvette Walcott Dennis and she asks, what are the examples and explanations on how PESES work with private uh, public employment services who are obviously aiming to benefit financially? And you said that you wanted to answer. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, Yvette. A very good question, um, one that often emerges. I think briefly I'd say there isn't uh, necessarily any conflict between financial benefit for providers and improving services. Perhaps in just two minutes, I'll give you a very, some very quick examples. Um, I mentioned Ireland during the presentation. During the financial crisis in Europe, Ireland needed to expand its coverage of support for long-term unemployed people who were not re often receiving support from the public employment service. So the government arranged for a bidding process whereby private providers would provide the infrastructure to provide counselling for long-term unemployed people. The private organisations would get paid based on the numbers of people they integrated and with more money being paid to them if they integrated more people who had more problems and barriers to labour market um, integration. And the programme was paid for by savings from the social assistance budget because the long term unemployed people would have been receiving social support had they not been moved into work. For the regions of the country, typically two providers were in competition with each other and ones receiving better performance would then get referred a higher number of clients. So limited choice, but competition to drive up uh, delivery standards. In Australia, as I mentioned, um, there was a process whereby a large number of organisations could bid to provide services in a certain location. And that meant that customers were able to um, have a choice of providers and they received information on the performance of the providers so customers could make a choice based on the track record of providers in improving their services and what they offered. Perhaps just again very briefly, um, in Colombia, a very interesting example where a couple of regions introduced a common brand and within that brand uh, the most appropriate provider could deliver services under the brand who could be public or private or an NGO and the most appropriate delivery organisation would deliver services in a particular location. Um, two very final quick examples. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, the public sector provides a very large database whereby any organisation can place vacancies and information on vacancies is scraped from private websites onto the public one. So in a sense, there's an open platform. So government provides the infrastructure and the window on the labour market and a mixture of public and private agencies can post their vacancies. And perhaps the very final point, particularly in some 
developing economies, um, it's proved to be quite beneficial for private employment agencies or temporary work agencies to receive details of registrations of from the public sector. And that means that the public sector can potentially provide the client seeking work and the private agencies who sometimes have a better link with employers in some developing countries where the PEZ require an early stage are able to offer them opportunities. So again, a potential win-win. So sorry, that was a very rapid answer, but I don't think there's necessarily a conflict between the uh, profit motive and private delivery and delivering better public service. It depends on how well managed and how designed the particular partnership is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imun, and for the question asked, um, I'm going to switch to Spanish. Voy a pasar a, a español porque la siguiente pregunta, Claire, fue la que dijo que, que la quería responder. Esta es hecha por Alejandro Sandí y pregunta eh, que, por ejemplo, los sistemas públicos de empleo de Francia y Croacia pueden identificar que una persona ya fue contratada por el empleador y que se le puede dar esa trazabilidad porque ya están conectados o tienen el convenio con la empresa del servicio social que brinda ese reporte. Si es así, ¿cuánto tiempo se duró realizando este convenio? ¿El proceso es manual o automático? Claire. No sé si he bien entendido la pregunta, pero yo creo que la, la, la respuesta es sí. En Francia, lo, todos los sistemas informáticos de Pôle emploi, de la seguridad social, de los impuestos, son todos conectados. Así que en nuestra database, cuando un desempleado es contratado por una empresa, tenemos la información en, en nuestro sistema informático. Es decir, que sabemos que ya es en empleo y no, pues no, no es desempleado. No sé si eso es la buena respuesta que esperaba el compañero. Ahí, ahí, ahí hay comentar que ya hay servicios públicos de empleo de, de la misma región que ya vienen haciendo ese tipo de cruces de datos. Por ejemplo, ahorita los estoy atendiendo desde Perú, yo estoy en Perú de misión, y acá en Perú, en el Ministerio de Trabajo de Perú, por ejemplo, ya está haciendo un esfuerzo para que eh, los datos de los colocados del servicio público de empleo eh, vengan de, eh, o sea, que se contrasten con los datos de lo que ellos llaman, de los datos administrativos que tiene el mismo ministerio, que es la planilla electrónica, que es básicamente la información de todo el empleo formal que existe en el país. Entonces una persona cuando es contratada por una empresa, la empresa la tiene que declarar y aparece en la planilla electrónica y esa información la maneja el ministerio y puede entonces ver en, si la persona está colocada en un empleo formal, si la persona cuánto tiempo tiene, eh, cuál es el ingreso de la persona, cuánto es la duración eh, que se va a quedar la persona en ese empleo, etc. Le permite el, al servicio público de empleo tener información muy valiosa para poder seguir mejorando, etc. Lo mismo se puede hacer en varios países. En Costa Rica está la información de la caja fiscal, eh, en, en Colombia está la pila, etc. Todos los países tienen estos datos administrativos. Como dice Claire, lo importante es que se pueda lograr esa interoperabilidad entre las distintas instituciones eh, del gobierno, ¿no? Disculpen por la interrupción. No, más bien, gracias. Eso enriquece más el, el diálogo. Eh, bueno, me parece que ya ahí atendimos y cualquier cosa también pueden volver a repreguntar en, en el chat si quedó algo. Con la siguiente pregunta, esta es abierta, la voy a hacer en inglés en caso de que Imon o Cristina quieran responder. This question um, has no bidder yet, so it can be answered by Cristina, Imon, or, or Claire. I'm going to read it in English. Uh, it's made by Jacqueline Gisset Arniwa, and she asks, uh, what are the recommendations for countries that are starting the process with public and private uh, partnerships? And in your criteria and experience, what would be the, the initial steps, the most important initial steps? Um, I can briefly introduce that. Yes. I think, first of all, um, it's important there's actually a market. So obviously, countries have developed uh, large scale public private partnerships often start small with some kind of piloting arrangements. And then over time, the market will grow. Obviously, if you were moving into a very large scale tendering exercise without a sufficient number of potential candidates to bid for contracts, you'd have a very suboptimal result. So it's about, I think, market development, establishing, first of all, you've got the correct legal enabling framework to enable the private sector to operate, making sure you've got the required expertise in-house to evaluate contracts, draft contracts properly, start through piloting and build the market gradually. 
I think that would be my kind of message there. And there are many, many examples in the literature from all over the world that you can look at to see learning from what's gone well and where people, one reflection, would do things differently if they were doing it again. Thank you. Thank you, Iman. And we can see, uh, we're going to share the presentation that Iman did, and, and there's a lot, a long list of references that you can uh, see. And Cristina, if you want to complement this question, just to remind you that the question was, what would be your recommendation if you're starting with, with public-private partnerships, what would be your recommendation of first steps? As Mr. Devon has said, I would basically say you can start with screening uh, your needs and what's available on the market. So you can draft then uh, uh, appropriate, uh, for example, agreements. So what kind of activities uh, would you include? And uh, also it's important from the legal side to, to know what can you put into agreement and what is uh, actually, I think, feasible because you need to be realistic as well. You, ha you can sometimes have a good goals and intentions, but maybe it's not realistic on the market. So just keep in mind that the ind indicators that you set for yourself, I would say. And if you have uh, the choice, you can also uh, through uh, contacting other services or uh, uh, institutions that have a good examples of previously doing that or establishing partnerships with other institutions, you can always learn from them or ask for advice. Thank you, Cristina. Um, the next question will be in Spanish. Esta pregunta se la hicieron a, a Claire, va dirigida a Claire, es hecha por Belsi Sánchez y pregunta eh, si Claire puede profundizar sobre la evaluación de rendimiento que hacen a los socios y cuál es su relación con el éxito de la estrategia de Pole Empleo. Sí, es, es algo sobre el, lo que estamos trabajando ya, porque es una pregunta muy importante, la, cómo medir la eficacia de nuestras alianzas. Y en realidad, eh, pues estamos trabajando sobre el tema, como con cuadros de seguimiento de las alianzas. Hay, hay alianzas um, muy simples, muy sencillas a seguir que otros. Por ejemplo, uh, hay, hay alianzas donde se puede tener números de usuarios que han beneficiado de, del servicio. Hay otros con las cuales es un poco más difícil. Uh, así que realmente he hablado con la directora de las alianzas de Pol Emploi preparando el webinar y es una pregunta, pues he visto que es una pregunta difícil para ella porque ya están trabajando sobre el tema. Así que pues están, están preparando cuadros de mando para, para seguir todo eso, pero realmente es en, es, están trabajando sobre el tema, así que no puede decir mucho más. Quizás más tarde. Muy bien, va a ser tema para el, el webinar de el, follow -up. Sí. Gracias. Y nos queda una pregunta más, ya, ya sé que estamos sobre el tiempo, pero una pregunta más que hace don Anciano Domínguez Espinosa de México. La voy a hacer en, en inglés, por si acaso alguien más quiere contestar. This question is, is from Mexico, from Donaciano Domínguez, and he asks how to strengthen the, the partnerships between public part, uh, between PES to impulse models of labor migration and human mobility. And he says that he thinks there are a lot of with private actors but maybe we are not making the alliances with our natural allies, no? Like with, uh, with different pests. So he, he, basically the question is how to strengthen the alliances amongst pests to promote a uh, labor migration and human mobility. Um, I mean, I think the Eures model as our colleague uh, from France mentioned is a very, very good one. It's probably one of the best examples I think of inter-country cooperation for labour mobility anywhere actually within the frame of the European Union. Um, that involves, I think, a, a protocol that the uh, individual countries, of course, share their vacancies on a common kind of website, which is very important. So it's make sure that people have got the available information to move. And also all of the individual countries in Eures provide lots of support to make sure that people moving are given counselling about the issues about moving to a different country and a different kind of labour market that they're moving to. So there's an infrastructure there. Obviously that's been around for about 30 years, as Claire mentioned now, but I think it's perhaps starting by um, making sure that you're providing appropriate information for people seeking to move trying to make sure you're building the necessary safeguards for people who are moving to a different kind of member state 
or different country as well. And perhaps building up from a few kind of bilateral relationships between countries and seeing what works and building up from there possibly. I think that might have clear if you've got any kind of, um, I think that would be my, my preferred approach. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's, uh, that's right. And uh, maybe another example could be that it's something we did uh, as technical assistance in Africa uh, yeah. is was called migration and the aim yeah. was to promote mobility in the Western Africa region. Yeah. Uh, so really promoting uh, migrations from one African country to the other, uh, because people tend to dream of something else. Yeah. And, and so the aim was really was to present the opportunities in, in, in very close countries to them, uh, rather than migrating very far away. So it was a good cooperation, also uh, yeah. a way to yeah. strengthen public employment services in a region. Yeah, I mean, perhaps just briefly in sort of 20 seconds, Sophia, really, I think that both public and private agencies can all be natural allies. It's about the appropriate incentives and the appropriate safeguards, particularly for migration. It's vital that migrants are not subject to difficult, precarious situations where they migrate. So there needs to be correct structure for monitoring and tracking people and making sure that the migration can be successful. But a whole range of actors can probably contribute to that within the correct framework. Thank you very much, Imon and Claire. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Christina, also for your time. I'm going to switch to, to Spanish to make the closing remarks. Um, muchas gracias a, a todos los panelistas, a todas las personas que se conectaron. Tuvieron una, tuvimos una muy buena convocatoria el día de hoy. De verdad les agradecemos por, por el tiempo y la atención. También les agradecemos por las preguntas que realizaron. Hay algunas preguntas que se quedaron sin contestar y las vamos a atender por correo electrónico a la lista de personas que tenemos inscritas. También vamos a compartir las presentaciones que se, que se vieron el día de hoy, así como el video del webinario. Eso se sube a nuestro sitio web, como dice Andrés. Entonces ahí pueden accesar a este webinario y a otros contenidos. Y nos veremos en el próximo webinario que hagamos. Como dijo Andrés, tendremos una serie de webinarios en el 2023 para que ustedes puedan aprovechar. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Sofía. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye. Gracias a todos y de verdad eh, súper contentos de haberlos tenido a todos acá en el webinar. Vemos que hemos tenido a más de 200 personas de nuestros miembros, así que todo un éxito y gracias a nuestros invitados. Este, hasta la próxima. Gracias.